My name is Susan Spencer Marola, and I'm president of the Larchmont Historical Society. I would like to welcome you to this, our introductory program of I Know a Village, produced by the Society on the occasion of the centennial of the village of Larchmont. In the coming weeks, we will take you on an armchair journey to a Larchmont of long ago, or just the other day. We will explore the many dimensions of Larchmont life, government, family, religion, education. We've assembled an array of guests as diverse and fascinating as Larchmont itself. We hope this series will inform and entertain, and we hope that future generations need only to watch these programs in order to learn firsthand about our times. A project of this scope requires the hard work and dedication of many people. I would first like to thank our guests for their generosity in sharing their experiences and expertise. I would also like to thank the production team headed by Eleanor Lucas, co-producer, and Jane Trenum, production advisor. Our ambitious interview series would not be possible, however, were it not for the tireless effort of Mary O'Connell. A graduate of Manhattanville and Catherine Gibbs, Mary began her first career as executive secretary. Following her marriage to Raymond T. O'Connell in 1946 and the arrival of her three children, Mary helped found and served as first president of the Manhattanville Westchester Club. She was board member and then president of the Westchester Catholic Education Conference. We all appreciate the contribution that volunteerism makes to the quality of life in Larchmont. Mary, who resided and raised her family in our community for 31 years, has left an indelible mark here as well. Mary was chairman of the Women's Interfaith Seminar, a member of the School Board Selection Committee, chairman of the Community Institute, president of Junior League of Westchester on the Sound, and held many volunteer positions with St. Augustine's. After a 10-year stint as Associate Dean of Continuing Education at Manhattanville, Mary became an entrepreneur. Certified as an oral historian, she founded her own firm, Recollections, 12 years ago. It is in this capacity that she lends her talent and expertise to our television series. Welcome, Mary. I shall now turn the program over to you. This is the first of the Historical Society series of reminiscences celebrating the village's centennial as its theme, as its theme, the title of a lovely poem, I Know a Village, by Larchmont's Poet Laureate Phyllis McGinley. Its first verse is, I know a village facing toward water less sullen than the seas, where flickers get their bed and board and all the streets are named for trees. And its last verse expresses what all of the participants in this series feel about Larchmont. It looks haphazard to the shore. Brown flickers build there, and I'd not willing, I think, exchange it for Arcadia or Camelot. We'll talk more about my friend, who incidentally was the first poet of light verse, not so incidentally, by the way, was the first poet of light verse to win a Pulitzer Prize for her collection, Times Three, selected verses for three decades, when our other Pulitzer winner, Walter Kerr, comes to the program. In an orderly sequence, we have asked Philip Reisman, Jr. to talk about the first residence of this small patch of land on Long Island Sound. Phil is a most modest man, a walking around encyclopedia, full of information on amazingly varied subjects. As a freelance film and TV writer, as he says, for 43 precarious years, he has drawers filled with the most distinguished award a writer can earn. To mention just a few, seven Motion Picture Academy Oscars for documentaries. His documentary, The Real West with Gary Cooper, is regarded in the history of television as the finest documentary ever written. It and another documentary of his earned two Emmys. And one of television's, television's most prestigious awards, a Peabody, was given to him for his adaptation of Mark Twain's Puddinghead Wilson. His volunteer work spanned many years of scouting the Larchmont Avenue Church Sunday School, where, which his five children attended, and dedicated service as a sergeant in the town of Amaranek Auxiliary. A valued member of the Larchmont Historical Society's board, you've been reading his fascinating flyers, a, slight, a Slice of Larchmont Life, which the Society has been distributing for the centennial months. Philip, I turn it over to you because you are, 
are going to start with the first people who lived on this patch of land, as I said. Thank you, Mary. It's going to be hard to follow that introduction. And I hope I don't disappoint you. But I, I thought that the in, you could pick an arbitrary date to begin the history of Larchmont, and so arbitrarily I picked the year 1614, because that was the year that uh, Larchmont left the Stone Age and entered the Machine Age. That was the year that a little Dutch sloop, the Onrust, the, the Restless, sailed out of New Amsterdam, the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, sailed up Long Island Sound on a ex voyage of exploration. Uh, they, had never, uh, they had never seen this part of Long Island Sound. And so they probably, I, I don't know what time of day it was that they sailed by what is now Larchmont. But if they had, uh, they would have seen perhaps the smoke of fires. And if they had been curious enough and dauntless enough to land, uh, which they were not, they were afraid of what they called red devils. There had been some problems with Henry Hudson up the Hudson. And uh, so they, they sailed on. Uh, but if they had landed, they would have uh, discovered uh, the original people of Larchmont. Now, there was, this was not a village here. This was between two villages. <coughs> it was common land between the village, uh, an Indian village called Mamaronek, which uh, really means place where he calls them together, and the village of Shippa, which was on Davenport Neck in New Rochelle. This was common land between them, and it was used seasonally, usually during the summer, uh, for fishing and hunting. So in a sense, the original large motors were commuters. They were going from <laughs> one place to another to their place of business. Uh, although they did tend to stay, they would not have, there was no village here, as I say, it was common land. Uh, the only evidence that we have uh, of it uh, is down in Manor Park uh, when there was when they were building the park they uncovered huge deposits of oyster and clam shells which indicated that these people would come over there for doing shell fishing uh, the premium river uh, was uh, there was evidence of fishing weirs underwater uh, which were traps fish traps as the tide would go in and out <coughs> it would trap fish and then when they could <coughs> harvest the fish with baskets and uh, uh, sharp sticks and spears and a on the corner of the uh, uh, Pinebrook Drive and uh, Palmer Avenue and the public park there and the there's a, uh, a baseball backstop and just behind that backstop there is a projecting shelf of rock. And there is there is record that that was, at one time, had been a fishing camp or hunting camp, either one. It was on the, uh, it, uh, directly adjacent to the Pine Brook, or Gravelly Brook, as it was called in the early days. And it was a fine place for hunters to wait for game to come down and drink. Um, recently, excavation was attended by ex excavation was was uh, done there and nothing was found a few flint chips evidence that somebody had been working on uh, on a stone implement but uh, the excavation did did not last long and was not so extensive that it would, that it turned up any more uh, and then the Sheldrake uh, Sheldrake River which uh, leads up into uh, the reservoir uh, was also uh, a, a known uh, hunting site. But those, that's the, about the only physical evidence that we have of the people that lived here. We know who they were because when the first Europeans came, they met them. Uh, they were a people called the, uh, the Siwanoi. And Siwanoi meant Southerners. And apparently it related to the fact that they were part of a federation which extended up into Dutchess County, and they were the southern part of that uh, thing. They were members of a tribe called the Mohicans, not Mohegans. The Mohegans were uh, over in Connecticut. 
but uh, although they sh shared a common language, they were not directly related. And they were, they were an Algonquin people. And Algonquins were, uh, Algonquin was, was a uh, language group. And uh, it united uh, all the eastern coastal tribes from uh, Quebec all the way down to North Carolina. They, they all spoke the same language or variations of it. They, since they didn't have a great deal of contact with each other, the language changed as it went up and down the, the river. Uh, it is probable that had uh, the crew of the Onrus landed, they would have been able to understand them because they had learned some of the, the language from the Indians on Manhattan. This was uh, just their fishing and hunting ground? Uh, they commuted back home? Yeah, and they also fished and hunted from their villages. Mm -hmm. Uh, but this was this was like the common. It was the mm -hmm. common land that they both could use. Uh, and but fishing and hunting uh, would be their primary purpose. You couldn't hunt too close to home because the game didn't come that close. Mm -hmm. So you had to get away from it. Fish fishing you could do anywhere, but apparently there was great shell fishing in this area, and that uh, uh, and that was an attractive thing for, for both the people. The uh, the summer visitors, which is really what they were, they were the first summer visitors to Larchmont, uh, did not live in houses, probably. They lived in tents or lean-tos, tents made of animal skins or lean-tos made of uh, uh, saplings. Uh, <coughs> so that uh, the typical Sinoi village that we're familiar with, which, which with the derby hat-shaped bark-covered houses or the loaf of bread shaped bark-up houses, you'd have to go to New Rochelle and Mamaroneck or Shippa and Mamaroneck to find. The people were probably, uh, uh, the, one of the problems is that there are very few accurate or believable, reliable descriptions of much of this, mostly because the Europeans who first came here were not that interested in them. They were considered them more a an impediment to, to the land than they did of uh, curiosity. But the records that uh, do exist indicate that the people had that were very tall, uh, six feet high, which was oh, at least the was men. Unusual, it, it was unusual. Uh, they were, ta uh, they said, tawny colored, which meant they were, had a Mediterranean cast to their skin. They painted themselves red, which is which was common with most of the Indians around here, and they, uh, most of the Eastern Indians, they used a red ochre that they found and uh, mixed with deer fat. Uh, partly they thought for beautification purposes and partly to keep away stinging insects, mm -hmm. and also uh, as a prevention from sunburn. But it, uh, it enabled the white colonists to refer to them as red devils mm -hmm. and redskins, and that's oh, where the that's word redskin, uh, the men were uh, dressed, you know, we're so used to the concept of the American Indian as wearing the zoo, eagle feather wore upon it, and the buckskin fringed shirts. <coughs> the men <coughs> wore what was, be, resembled very much a Roman toga. It was, uh, the right arm was bare because they used that to uh, handle their tools and weapons. Uh, and it was uh, deerskin usually. <coughs> they, uh, in their hair, uh, they tended to uh, shave with a, uh, with a burnt rock, with a red hot rock. They would uh, try and sh burn off the stubble uh, on their hair, and they had a comb up and down the middle, like a, a dragoon's helmet, with the, uh, uh, deer, which they reinforced with red dyed deer, <coughs> deer, uh, uh, Deer, deer fur. Uh, they wore turkey feathers in their hair, the same way the Sioux wore eagle feathers. A turkey feather was was highly prized by these people as an ornament, and apparently had some kind of heraldic significance. They uh, they they were barefoot mostly around the camp, although they sometimes wore uh, moccasins made out of uh, corn husks. They were disposable. Deerskin moccasins, they save for the trail, where there would be extensive wear and tear on their, on their shoes and on their feet. The women wore what would be called a shift dress. They, they had no needle and thread. They did not sew. 
So what they would do, they would make a poncho with a hole in the middle for the head, and they would fasten it down the sides with thorns, just uh, pushing them through. Um, as I say, they didn't, they had no weaving skills at all, except very rudimentary that they would weave rushes and grass to make mats. But as far as their clothing was concerned, they, they didn't. Um, the children uh, <coughs> were spoiled, which uh, almost all Indian children were spoiled. A lot of similarities to uh, <laughs> modern day. And they never, they never beat them. Uh, they corrected them. <coughs> their, their method of correction was to, a child who cried. And that was the one thing they could not tolerate, was a crying child, because it could, one, it could disturb game if they were on a trail, or two, it would alert their enemies. Warn them. Enemy. So the, the way they stopped uh, uh, the child from cry, crying was to uh, gently throw him in a cold running stream. <coughs> and, and he would gasp a lot, uh -oh. but he stopped, stopped crying. crying. And this, uh, they, they did tend to spoil them until about the age of the boys, about the age of eight, at which point they were expected to grow up very rapidly. And then they were turned over to their fathers for training and hunting and fishing and uh, all the manual skills that they needed. The, the, uh, problem, the, the difficulty that the women had was that everything they, that they did, everything the men did was dangerous which wasn't a whole lot, unless there was... Everything the women did was arduous, which was everything. <laughs> they did the building, they did, they did the, the farming, except for the first plow that was turned, was ceremoniously turned by a, a man who then sat under the tree and watched the women do all of it. <laughs> Excuse me, do all the fun. Another tradition. Oh, I did that. <laughs> Things haven't changed. <laughs> uh, these people were... Uh, of a culture called the woodland. It was the last of the, of the primitive cultures. They were, uh, so the last thousand years were woodland Indians, which meant that they, they were no longer nomads, they were no longer just hunters, they were no longer just fishermen. They couldn't move from place to place because now they were farmers. And farmers yeah. had to stay where yeah. the crops were. Further than that, and the indication that they were really becoming tied to their community was that it was a ceramic culture. They made pottery, and no Indian could, no Indian tribe would make pottery if it had to travel. The, the Sioux, the horseback Indians, had no pottery. They put everything uh, that they owned if they moved, and they moved constantly in uh, buckskin pouches, envelopes or yeah. pouches. But you couldn't move if you had food and everything else in in pots. So. This meant that uh, this end of the scale of, of Indian life was no longer nomadic. They were living, uh, given, left alone for another couple hundred of years. They would have developed probably or possibly the same kind of culture that the Pueblo Indians had. They were sedentary. They stayed. They built houses. They were no longer living in tents or huts. They were living in, in houses with windows and doors. And, but that wasn't to be in large part. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about where they live, Phil, what, what uh, geographic area was this now? They, village? The, the, the village, which village? We, we Larchmont. Larchmont was not a village then. I know. Uh, where did the Indians, what, uh, where was their well, encampments? Encampment. We have never found any, any indication of where they camped. All we've ever found is where they worked. Oh. Uh, there were never very many Siwanoi Indians to begin with. We tend to think of Indians as being rather numerous. The, uh, these Indians lived, the Siwanoi lived in an area running from about 125th Street in New York City all the way up to Norwalk, Connecticut, in little villages. Uh, there must have been, <coughs> at, at any one time, maybe 15, 20, 30 little villages, and never very many people because <coughs> Uh, the economy couldn't have supported a large population, and they tend to limit. Phil, so could I ask a question? Sure. I read somewhere that there were never more than about, it's estimated, never more than about 300 That's right. Simonoids at any one time, and I always wanted to check that with an expert because it's just <laughs> astounding well, to think of. 
I, my guess is, and it's all a guess because I don't think anybody really knows, the problem is the pe people who are in a position to know and note it weren't interested. So mm -hmm. that now we can uh, only guess. Uh, you have to base it on, on the economy, what it could support. Mm. Uh, may, I think there are more, more than that, but, but Marinek, for instance, might have been as many as 80 or 100. Mm -hmm. uh, Shippa and Rochelle might have been the same. Uh, and they were among the, the larger groups. Uh, and also, many of them were interchangeable. They kept changing. They were, they were not nomadic, but they were not totally sedentary. Mm -hmm. And it's hard, since nobody took a census, to know. Mm -hmm. You just no have to guess. <laughs> no. I always heard that they uh, had a large encampment on Cortland Avenue overlooking the harbor. I'm sure they did. Yeah, that would have that been, would an, have been ideal an ideal place. spot. Yeah, mm. Sure. Mm. In fact, in fact, they they dug. I had a friend yeah. that dug in the ground and found all kinds of right. things and there. That's where you'd find it. Uh, there, around uh, Cedar Island, is another place where they have found artifacts, mm -hmm. but relatively relatively few. And one of the reasons is that our topsoil has been disturbed a great deal over the years. It's a real estate area, as you know, and there's a lot of digging. And there's a lot of gardening. There's a lot, a lot of, uh, uh, in fact, Westchester County mm -hmm. and York County, Virginia, and um, uh, Plymouth, Plymouth, around Plymouth, Massachusetts, I don't know what the county is, are probably the three of the most um, archaeologically disturbed areas mm -hmm. in the country. <coughs> yeah, I didn't Mostly know that. Mostly because they were the first settled. Mm -hmm. And also, there are had been developed and redeveloped over so many years. You're talking about this Saguenoy uh, camp, though, as a summer colony almost. Where did they winter? Well, that's an interesting thing. They, when you build a house you can and put fires in it, mm. you can stay. But they didn't. They, they moved back from the shore, uh, back into the woods, for a couple of reasons. It was the, where the game was. And that was starvation time, usually, anyhow, unless they could save enough and dry it. So they would tend to move back into the woods inland, maybe up uh, as far as the, uh, uh, the old Larchmont Reservoir mm -hmm. or further. Ah. Uh, they couldn't go too far because if they went too far, they were in somebody else's territory. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but that, no, that's generally what they did. And this was summertime in here. Uh, and they, of course, they could dry fish. They could do all sorts of th things to to save them from uh, real starvation problems in mm. the winter. They were, mm. they were not particularly, Indians generally uh, did go through starvation times because their knowledge of food preservation consisted of drying. Sure. Uh, yeah. But farming was their main uh, activity and it required the closest attention. And their main crop was? Their, well, they had three main crops. They called them the three sisters. They had beans and squash and corn. And they, they would plant the corn first, uh, and it would grow. Then they would plant the beans below it, and that would climb the corn. And then the, the squash <laughs> would be down at the bottom. And there was a reason for that, is that it would save the arduous task of tilling a mm -hmm. large yeah. area. Those women were smart. They <laughs> sure were. They were exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, also, here, and they would be probably as close to the water as they could get without, to the sound as they could get without the burning wind, but partly because they fertilized these mounds with menhaden, ah. which is a very oily fish, and, uh, and they, did, they knew about uh, fertilization. Mm -hmm. uh, they had no metal, of course, because as I said, this was a Stone Age people. And everything they used was made out of either wood or shell or stone. Um, and the only thing that we have left is what was made of stone because it was not perishable. But the, most of their tools probably were wood or bone or shell. Uh, but farming was especially difficult because it had to, the ground had to be cleared unless they could find a natural meadow. There is one in Mamaronek which was recorded as having been a, a natural meadow, and that's uh, Columbus Park. Hmm. And that was, if you could see that and not see the trees, that would have been a, 
an ideal place for them to use as a farm. Uh, they had no animals, no uh, uh, except the dog. That's there so were no sad. horses, no oxen, uh, no domestic animals. The dog <coughs> was a descendant of a prehistoric dog, which probably came over the land bridge with the first Indians. And it was strictly an Asiatic dog. It was a, uh, a breed of its own. And it turns up everywhere in North America, the same dog. And still you can find them in Indian uh, camps. What kind of a dog? Well, the, the <laughs> characteristic was a curly tail. It had a hmm. cork, it tail went out and then it took a curl and went straight out again. And you can see it in early paintings uh, of the West, the earliest paintings. There's always a camp dog in there somewhere, and there is a little curly tail. Um, they were not pets, the dogs. They used to keep them hobbled so they wouldn't dig up the fish that they planted in the... Uh, the fertilizer? In the fer yeah, the mm. fertilizer. They, uh, they were watchdogs. Mm. They, were, they were not friendly. They were strictly watchdogs. Scavengers, they kept the camp clean. They would eat refuse. And in a starvation time, they'd eat throw the, the dog? dog in the pot, too. They, they had no great affection for, for them. Uh, as I said, these were a ceramic people. They made pottery. Uh, and they made them the way we made it in kindergarten. You'd take the, you know, make like coils, that. and then you'd coil them around. The clay was uh, ordinary mud, and it had a binding uh, with mica, mica or, or ground up uh, shells, that, which would hold it so they could withstand the firing. Uh, and no decoration, no painted decoration. They hadn't attained that yet. But what they did was they incised little bands around the top. If you ever come, come across it, it's the only way you can recognize that if you find a fragment, and you find a fragment of the lip of the pot, as, as though they'd taken, and did, in fact, take their fingernail, make little crescents all the way around it. Like a pie crust. Well, did yeah. they have an aesthetic sense? What? Well, to that extent, yeah, it was primitive. It mm. was primitive. They had mostly feathers and shells and things mm. like that. Uh, as far as we know, they did no painting of any kind. Um, the decoration was was incidental, although I imagine it was. Uh, they did. They did like the the beads and the jewelry, so they, they had an aesthetic Makes sense. sense of design. Yes. Well. No, not, it was limited to the fingernail going around. <laughs> I mean, as far as I know, there I mean, was they no, never got no, beyond kindergarten. No, not really. <laughs> Pot making. <laughs> <laughs> and their fishing, to, to go briefly into that, they, they were major fishermen. Um, they, uh, the shellfish, of course, were the easiest to gather, and they, you could do it with the greatest, uh, without any risk. But, uh, they had canoes. They had uh, huge dugout canoes. Uh, they did have some elm bark canoes, which they used on, on slow running water. But primarily, they uh, they used the dugouts, and they were anywhere from uh, oh, five to fifteen feet long, and they were enormously heavy. So they had huge projections on either end that looked like bowsprits on both ends, and they were used to carry these yeah. things because they were as I say, very, very heavy. Um, they would go out to, in deep water with them. In fact, even used to go whale hunting with them. But they didn't go for the big Moby Dick whales. They went for the little whales. And they would tend to beach them. They would herd them to shore and let them beach themselves. And, uh, and sturgeon were the two uh, big game fishes that they, that ah. they saw. Ah. Uh, now, we get to the part where they start to change, and they start to change with the arrival of the colonists um, who wanted the English colonists and the Dutch were interested in land. The French wanted furs, they wanted pro uh, things. The Spanish wanted gold, but the English wanted land. They came from a small island where there was no more farming land. And here was a whole continent opening up, so they could hardly wait to get in there and plat it off into Well, I into think fun. Judy's going to pick up on the, the European settlers, so... Oh, fine, fine. Yeah. Well, I'll just indicate then that what happened was the... Uh, were you going to talk about the wampum? 
Go right ahead, please. I was not <laughs> going to talk about the wampum. Okay. Well, the wampum was important because it marked the end of the Indian culture. When the English got here, they were a commercial people, and they were used to buying and selling. They weren't like the Spanish and the French, and particularly Spanish who would take it and offer no recompense. The English had this strong sense of fairness. If you want something, you pay for it. The only trouble was the Indians had no currency and didn't understand currency or uh, money. So the English did a very English thing. They invented a currency. They took the thing that the, Engl the Indian prized the most, which was the shell beads, the wampum, which also, besides being decorative, were also uh, uh, ceremonial. Uh, there's a perfect example. There is a string of beads that didn't come from here. It came from directly across the water on Long Island, and it's absolutely typical of the kind of wampum that they would have had here. That's a, a sirenoid dime. That would be <laughs> about 10 cents, because the, uh, depending on what time of uh, uh, what the rate of exchange was, it kept fluctuating. In fact, it kept changing because somebody over in New Jersey was counterfeiting it, and that really threw the market. <laughs> How do you it's, counterfeit? Why do you mean easy, from doing that? Easy. They used uh, China, of uh, porcelain. Ah. They, they, and you could turn out loads of it. And it was laborious to make a bead like that because they would take the columnar part of a shell and do this with fine sand until mm. it assumed a mm. cylindrical shape. Then they had to pierce it. So they would take a, a hard reed of some kind with a sharp point, and they would, again, do this, mm. and throw in very fine sand to give it a grinding surface. So the amount of, of labor that went into one of those things alone justified the, uh, the value that they put on it. But as I say, the value was, uh, tended to fluctuate. Uh, and uh, I just arbitrarily said that was a dime but it could have been more or less. And probably was about uh, uh, five English pennies, which would have been 10 cents. Uh, but they needed that because they wanted to buy the land. And uh, they decided they were going to buy Mamaroneck. Uh, John Richbell bought it. Uh, and reading the deed, uh, well, now Judy's going to talk uh, about that. Let's, You're going to read that? Uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear what Phil has to say. Well, uh, I was just going to say reading the deed where it was 100 fathoms of wampum plus 10 shillings in, what were pro in wampum, which was probably unstrung beads because it was more valuable strung than it was loose. Yeah. Uh, and the total, depending on the rate of exchange at that time, and I can only estimate if it was white beads, which were the least valuable. Uh, these are white beads, although they, they look kind of gray. What he paid $102 for Mamarinac. It was all in black beads. He paid $306. Uh, it was a better deal than uh, Peter Minuit gave for the, for the island of Manhattan. It was $24, allegedly, in trinkets. And because the Indians he bought it from didn't own it, <laughs> they were the Canarsie Indians on, uh, on holiday, I guess. <laughs> That was the earliest scam in, yeah. the, in the history of this Not country. Not such a good word for real estate. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Wapakuyam, who sold it, uh, didn't do too well either because he never collected all the money and he tried to sue. And as far as I know, that's still in the courts. But anyway, that was the end of the Stone Age in Larchmont. And uh, if you want to know what happened to him, nobody knows for sure. They, they disappeared due to the blessings of civilization, disease, alcohol intermarriage, enemies, they had many of those, and fled to, Delo to the Delawares across the Hudson, were absorbed into, uh, who were friends, absorbed into the Delaware tribe, just in time to get moved to Oklahoma. So then, wow. that's the end of the side. Wonderful. Road. Oh, Philip, you, got, you brought something else along. Oh, yes. Well, this is the Stone Age. When I was a boy in New Rochelle, I found these three while working in the garden with my mother. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I found these two. This one I found on the way to school. Uh, it was the day I wasn't anxious to get there, so I was exploring all the, <laughs> I was about nine years old. Uh, and these others, uh, my wife's family had these. They were the upper part of the Sirenoi range up in Norwalk. Uh, these are uh, intrusions of some kind. They were, they're Westchester County, but uh, they may predate all of this. I, I don't know, and I have no way of knowing. But these are, 
uh, the typical. If anybody is working in his garden and sees a little, these are characteristic of all Algonquin tribes. So that if you're in Massachusetts or uh, anywhere along the Atlantic coast and you see a white quartz arrowhead, it's a Siwanoi. Mm -hmm. Probably. Not necessarily, but probably. Well, thank you very much. That's only one subject that Phil is an expert on. Uh, he has so many others that I think he should be invited back over and over and over again. We turn now to um, Judith Spikes. Many people who will appear in this series have and are making significant contributions to the quality of life in the village, but the significance of our next guest's work cannot be overestimated. It is and will evermore B, the village's cherished treasure of archival material, pictures, oral histories, and videotapes. Dr. Judith Spikes, the founder of Larchmont Historical Society in 1980, is a scholar, the winner of a Fulbright, a Woodrow Wilson, and University of Chicago fellowships, a former academician, and currently editor, author, and president of Fountain Square Publishing Editorial Services. A resident in the manor, she has written two brief histories of the manor, round and about, a brief of account of who was who and what was what, and Larchmont on the Sound, the rise and decline of resort hotels. These are available for, through the Historical Society at Anderson's Bookstores. Well, I have to give you a big plug for those, Judith. Uh, her next book, Larchmont, People and Places, is due any moment, any right? Moment. Uh, we were hoping to have it here today. And I would guess the Mamaronic Daily Times circulation jumped considerably as soon as her current se series on the village's history started to appear. Judith, before you pick up on the village's history, when the first Europeans set, stepped foot on shore in 1661, I think it would be interesting if you'd tell us how you came to be the official village historian and why and when you founded the society. I know it was eight, 1980, but would you talk about that first? Um, Yes, I will, I will try to do that. Um, we moved to Larchmont in January of 1974, and even before I got the dishes unpacked, I ran off to the Larchmont Public Library and asked to see the history of Larchmont. Uh, I was astounded to learn that there was none. So then I asked, well, give me the address of the Historical Society. And again, I was astounded to find that there was none. Um, I began... Um, researching primary source material, looking for the history of Larchmont, since yeah. there was no published history. Uh, I, I really started, as best I recall, with deeds, because I, one of the first things that I was curious about, I was told that the house that we'd moved into had served for some 25 years as the manor school for girls. And I wanted to know more about that. And from there, I branched out. Once I got into that, then I began to get interested in adjacent pieces of land and the, the names that appeared in the deeds. And so I kept working with the deeds and that led me to wills, census records, tax records, um, manuscript collections, mostly in New York City and various repositories and so forth and so on. Um, I think I'd like to, I'd like to hold the uh, history of the Historical Society just for a minute. Sure. And briefly, um, very briefly, I hope, go over um, 350 years of, of history <laughs> in Larchmont. Um, probably everybody does know that the first deed to the land that um, Larchmont now makes up a part of um, was made in 1661. And that was between John Richbell and two Simonoids who claimed to be acting for, this is in the deed, all Indians living up Hudson River and elsewhere in America. Um, I'm sure Phil could tell us a great deal <laughs> about um, what was going on here, whether the Indians uh, understood, had any idea of what was being written down in the deed, whether they had any idea that the uh, Europeans really thought they were buying the land instead of just renting it and so forth and so on. But at any rate, that was in 1661, the first, um, the first document detailing European ownership um, of this land. And that included um, just about the same six and a half or so square miles that now make up um, um, the town of Mamaroneck. Now, it was another 40 years before anybody settled on the square mile of land that now makes up the village of Larchmont. Uh, that happened in 1699. Uh, the Palmer family, originally um, 
part of John Winthrop's fleet of Puritan reformers and having started out in the Massachusetts colonies and then migrating through Connecticut and to um, the borough town of Westchester, which is now in the Bronx, and finally to, um, to the town of Mamaroneck and onto the square mile of land that now makes up the village of Larchmont. They built their um, farmhouse about where the Larchmont Public Library now stands. Um, Samuel Palmer and his wife Mary Drake had six sons and right up to the Revolution the Palmers were um, just about the only people. There were some allied families but they were just about the only people who lived in what we now call Larchmont. They were Quakers, a uh, fact that had a great deal to do with their moving to Larchmont but it's a story we don't have time to go into today. They, um, in 1704, they secured permission from the Crown to hold Quaker meetings in their home, which makes them one of the first, if not the first, officially sanctioned place of Quaker worship on the mainland. Mm -hmm. And they also donated the land across the post road uh, for the Quaker Cemetery, which is still there. The meeting house that was built there was moved some time ago up Weaver Street, and some remnant of it probably survives in the Scarsdale Historical Society's um, museum house, some small remnant, perhaps, of that um, original meeting house. Now, as I say, the Palmers were pretty much the only people who did live here right up to the Revolution. Um, when Samuel died, he left his property in four equal parts to his four surviving sons, and one of these sons in 1770, well, slightly before 1776, but um, sold the property, about 120 acres, that included the Premium River and the Mill Pond and that area. And the purchaser very soon thereafter sold it in 1776 to James Mott. Now, James Mott was another Quaker. Uh, at the time the revolution broke out, he was young man, about 33 years old, a wealthy merchant living with his family in New York City. And he had had um, ancestors, a, a great, great, great something or other. Captain James Mott had lived in uh, the town of Mamaroneck at the time of Rich Bell. But for, and his, uh, James Mott's in-laws were living in this area. So he decided that it would be a safer place to bring his family during the Revolution. They left New York City, they bought this property on the Premium River, and it was perhaps not quite like jumping out of the fat into the fire, but Westchester County, in particular Lower Westchester County, was not a good place to be during the um, years of the American Revolution. Um, it was called the neutral ground, but what that really turned out to mean was that it was a no man's land. There was no sort of government, either civil or military, to protect the inhabitants. Uh, they were overrun first by one army and then by another, uh, by bands that were called cowboys and Indians, and it, <laughs> uh, cowboys and skinners. And as you read the stories about these bands of outlaws, um, and if you happen to remember the old um, cowboy and Indian movies of the 1940s or so, it seems to have been pretty much mm -hmm. the same sort of thing. Now, the Mots did manage to hold on um, through, uh, through the revolution. And I just want to mention one thing. Um, James Mott and, and his two older sons, as they grew up, at, were at the time very famous Quaker preachers. They preached all up and down the eastern seaboard and on Nantucket. Uh, James Mott was the headmaster of Nine Partners, a Quaker school farther upstate. He was quite, quite a well-known man in his day. He was uh, absent from, from the farm and mill a great deal. Um, one of his grandsons, whose name was also James, uh, met Lucretia Coffin at Nine Partners. And they married and lived briefly in Larchmont. Then they went on to Philadelphia where she became uh, Lucretia Coffin Mott, the um, great abolitionist and feminist. But we did have her very briefly <laughs> here in Larchmont. In fact, if the uh, premium mill, if the Mott's mill had not failed um, following the War of 1812, they probably would have stayed here rather than gone to Philadelphia where her parents were at the time. Most of the other people who were living here during the Revolution, however, they, they gave up and moved away during the war. So by the time the war ended in uh, 1783, most of the land was for sale. To move away where? politically? To go to Canada? or to Not go? that far. 
uh -huh. they moved inland. Uh -huh. um, were they maybe counties? For safety more than for safety. politics. No, no, for safety. Uh -huh. Okay. For safety. Uh, it was very much a civil war here, probably mm -hmm. about half and half, um, patriot and loyalist. And, but it was mostly for safety. They moved away. The land was for sale. And in 1795, Peter J. Monroe began buying up most of the rest of the Palmer uh, Purchase. Now, the Mott's were still here but most of the rest of that uh, square mile of land that the Palmers had bought was for sale. Peter J. Monroe spelled M-U-N-R-O. I mention that only because I keep seeing it spelled the wrong way. <laughs> the wrong way. Okay. Um, he was the son of an Anglican clergyman um, who was um, attached to the Van Cortlandt estate in Yonkers. And his mother was Eve J., uh, sister of John J. of Rye. Now, when the war broke out, uh, Peter J. Monroe's father abandoned the family. He served uh, for a short time with British forces, and then he returned to England. Uh, Peter J. Monroe's mother had what we used to, what used to call a nervous breakdown. And so Peter, who was their only son, was raised by his uncle, John J. Hmm. Now, he bought his first piece of land in Larchmont, as I say, in 1795. Um, when he was a recently married and a young lawyer who had just completed his apprenticeship in the law offices of Aaron Burr. In fact, Aaron Burr assisted him and his wife in eloping from a New Year's party to get married because uh, his wife's family thought that he was not um, a suitable match for their uh, wealthy and highborn daughter. Um, Monroe um, built the, uh, what we now call the Manor House at the head of Prospect Avenue on Elm. And he also planted the larches along the post road that later gave our village its name. But the name itself was coined by the next owner of the property, who was a man by the name of Edward Knight, K-N-I-G-H-T, <laughs> Collins. Now, Phil probably knows who Edward Knight Collins is, and if there are any um, people in our audience who are um, um, American shipping history buffs or other kinds of specialized historians, they no doubt know who he was too because he was, was one of the most famous men of his time. He built the, he was a naval architect. Uh, he, he designed as well as had built and operated the first American steamships to cross the Atlantic. And he ran the first U.S. mail service to Europe. Um, when he purchased um, the old Monroe estate and named it Larchmont, he was pretty much on, at the peak of his career. But very soon thereafter, he, um, his ships suffered a series of disasters. He eventually became virtually bankrupt, moved off to take care of his um, iron mining properties in Ohio. And the um, estate, again, went on the auction block. Um, just before that, though, I, I would like to mention that I finally found proof that in 1860, Edward Knight Collins commissioned Frederick Law Olmsted to make a survey of his estate. There's no evidence in the Olmsted papers in the Library of Congress that uh, this was carried out. Um, it, very likely it was carried out. All these years, out. I've thought this was done by Frederick Law. Yes, that's why I, I wanted to... Um, well, bring this out. I, Judy, identify Frederick Law Olmsted for our viewers. Well, Frederick Law Olmsted was the first American landscape architect, and in 1860, he would have been famous for his fairly, re at that time, fairly recent design of Central Park. And yes, there is a persistent um, myth. He didn't do Manor Park? That the great man himself designed our beloved park. Um, mm -hmm. He was, there is proof, as I say, that he was commissioned to survey all of did it. Collins' estate in 1860. Um, and there happens to be a map in, uh, that I found under the eaves in Village Hall that might or might not be the survey map that was drawn at that time. One would have to uh, take the engineer's name from the map and get into, again, into the Olmsted archives to find out if this person who signed the map was working for Olmsted at the time. But this, no doubt, is the origin of this, of this myth. It began, probably began at that time in, uh, in memory. And then as it rolled down through the years, well, we know very well who designed Manor Park. 
It was uh, designed by um, Frank Toll. Uh, his name is on the map that he drew and so forth and so on. Uh, which is probably, I'm getting a little off my story, but <laughs> I've got a couple of seconds. <laughs> Inspired. Um, probably a, another piece of, of the oral legend uh, was contributed there because, first of all, Toll was a, um, he, he bought the uh, gingerbread house ah. mm -hmm. in 1872, one of the first two families to buy in the manor. And he, uh, but he, his permanent home was in New York City where he was an engineer associated with the city of New York. May I ask you one question before you do sure. that? Tell me whether it is a myth about the Underground Railroad and the slaves in the manor, and the manor house, house and the well, dungeon think, in there. I think I'm going to have to hold that for a minute. Okay. All right. And um, also, Frank Toll's father, Jeremiah, who was, again, a very famous man of his time. In fact, the Toll House is a, a museum house in New York City now, um, had been Parks Commissioner. So my, I believe that that myth, no doubt, originated it's, uh, things all get mixed up in memory mm -hmm. when they're not written down, when a, a history book isn't made out of them. And I believe that this is the origin of the myth, the combination of um, Collins having commissioned Olmsted to survey the property, and then the fact that both Frank Toll, who, who drew the, the, the map, Map 610, and um, his father Jeremiah were associated with the city of New York and with Central Park, and probably in some at least tangential way with Olmsted in the design of the park. Um, now, when Collins went, as I say, Collins did go bankrupt, and the estate again went on the auction block in 1865, and it was bought by Thompson J.S. Flint, um, at that time a New York City banker. He'd been born in Maine and made his fortune in Illinois, but he was living in New York City at the time that he purchased the property. In 1872, uh, Flint formed the Larchmont Manor Company to subdivide um, the property, it's 288 acres. Uh, that was when he uh, commissioned Frank Toll to draw the map, map 610, uh, defining the area of the manor. And Flint announced in the New York Times that it was his intention to develop the property as a suburb for the families of New York City businessmen of moderate means. But this undertaking got off to a slow start, and most of the dwellings erected in the early years were only summer cottages, not year-round residences. So that Larchmont became, in effect, for oh, somewhere between 10 and 15 years, more of a summer resort than a suburb. Like the Silenoi. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the development of Larchmont, as I say, it, it languished there for a while. Of course, we had a few um, um, national um, uh, recessions, if not actual depressions, along the way. Uh, but it got a shot in the, in the arm with the formation of the Larchmont Yacht Club in 1880. Um, many fabulously wealthy men, and they of course were all men, um, subsequently joined the club. Uh, a couple of names that come to mind are Caldwell Colt and J.P. Morgan. These people did not live in Larchmont, even in the summer, but their association with the Larchmont Yacht Club brought uh, fame and a, a sort of aura of um, leisured aristocracy or something to the area. So that by January of 1891, enough lots had been sold that the Larchmont Manor Company announced its intention to disband. Now, at that point, a committee of people who had bought lots in the manor started meeting to try to decide what should be done to maintain the streets and the other public services that the Larchmont Manor Company had previously um, provided. And at last they decided that, the, after considering several possibilities, they decided that what made most sense was to incorporate as a village. So after fulfilling all of the required formalities, incorporation papers were filed on September 2nd, 1891, and Larchmont became a municipality. Now, I'm not going to go into the subsequent history of the village, except that I would like to point out three, uh, what I think are the three most important factors in the history of the village as having been already established in 1891. The first factor is geographical. The long shoreline on Long Island Sound, because it was the waterfront, um, as Phil pointed out, that drew people here from the days of the Simonoi Indians through uh, the Palmers, the Mots, um, the Monroes, the Collinses, and in fact the Flints. And then when the Larchmont Manor Company set aside 12 acres of the best waterfront land to be held in common by those who bought lots in the manor, 
this created the magnet that continued to draw people um, to Larchmont, enough people to make incorporation possible. As I would say that the waterfront is one of the first factors in making Larchmont what it is today and in, in determining its history. A second factor after 1880 was social. The Larchmont Yacht Club created the aura that still lingers around the name of this little village. It's a village of 6,000 people, and anywhere I go from one end of the United States to the other, if I tell somebody I'm from Larchmont, they say, oh, yes. Hooray. <laughs> <laughs> Hooray. <laughs> oh, yes. They may not know anything about it, but they know the name. Gives It, it has name recognition. And also um, certainly set the tone up to, I would say, probably about uh, the Second World War, uh, set a certain tone in the village. The third factor is demographic, and this factor was firmly established by 1900, and that's the transience of the population. I'm sure Emmy Lou knows a lot about that. There, uh, just to give you one example, there are 147 surnames, and it's family names, I'm not counting individuals, but 147 different family names in the 1891 village census and tax rolls. In the 1900 federal census, that's only nine years later, there are 174 family names, but only 34 names are the same. Ooh. Mm. Right. Of 147 families living in Larchmont in 1891, only 34 remained, mm. only nine mm. years later. And the trend continues um, up to this day, I believe. It's a little hard to be positive since um, uh, the, uh, the enumerated census records are under a 70-year binder. But um, of the families, as far as uh, you know, we can tell from the evidence, of the families counted in any decennial census, at least half, on average, moved on by the next. And this trend, um, and up until 1980, those who departed were more than replaced by a fresh wave of newcomers. After 1980, we began to have a population decrease. So to sum up, the waterfront is a magnet, the Larchmont Yacht Club to set a social tone, and a rapid turnover of population. Seems that virtually all of the 20th century history of Larchmont can be explained by some combination of those three factors. Judy, would you touch on, on um, the, the fascinating information that you wrote about, about the resort hotels because it was, the village was on the water? Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, the, this um, began really with um, the air of the resort hotels began actually because the Larchmont Manor Company was not so successful in uh, selling its lots at first, and some of the uh, people who had bought and built summer cottages um, fell on hard times. They opened their houses uh, in total violation of the uh, uh, deed covenants to borders, and for the most part, um, the lesser, at first it was sort of the lesser um, the stars of um, the stage and vaudeville uh, began to frequent these um, boarding houses in the summer. Um, then some more important and wealthier um, such people were attracted, and hotels specifically designed to cater to um, this kind of a clientele were built. Of course, the only one um, that remains in its um, original form is the Manor Inn, which originally was called the Belvedere. And the Bevan Hotel, um, the front part of it is still the same. It was sliced it's now in a half. House. <laughs> yeah, it's, mm. now, it's now a very large house. It still remains. Um, but it gave us a, a whole theatrical flavor, and it, it a large amount began to attract a lot of artists, writers, uh, people of the arts mm -hmm. that it might never have attracted if they hadn't come in the summer originally. Um, no? Yes. Yes, perhaps. There, there was certainly a, a large theatrical colony here up to about World War I, a theatrical colony in the summer. I had heard, and I always put this in the myth category along with the uh, underground chambers and the, so on, <clears throat> was there a stop on the Underground Railroad? And I had heard that mm -hmm. the Mott family's mill mm -hmm was a stop on the Underground Railroad. Now, is there any truth in that? All I can say is that there is no evidence, no evidence. whatsoever. This doesn't mean it isn't true, mm -hmm. but well, evidence has been searched for by many people, and no evidence mm -hmm. has been found. Got a funny little room in the basement of the manor house. 
Well, you see, now that's it's interesting. The wine <laughs> the funny, this funny little room, what I have always heard prior to this, is in the um, cellar of the house at 60 Beach Avenue that was once Phyllis McGinley's. Really? Home, and is known by the Wassermans. Mm -hmm. And I think that I think that this is exactly the way that story started. Mm -hmm. One person heard something about one place, and as the years went by and it went through many, many mouths, it got changed to another place and another time, and one thing and another. That little room in the Wasserman house, one just like it, was conclusively identified in a house up county as a, uh, what did we used to call them? It was a... Um, coal cellar? Coal cellar, exactly. Yeah. There's another thing. I think the name Underground Railroad suggests mm -hmm. something that is underground, has a mysterious sound to it, when in fact it could have been an attic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had the slaves wherever they were least likely to be found. Mm -hmm. But the word underground then suggests cellars, mm -hmm. and you find a mm -hmm. funny little room in a cellar, root cellar or a cold cellar. And that can uh, very often, as folks say, I think, not mm -hmm. history. And this is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, Judith, Sorry. we'll come back to you. Okay. Turning now to Emmy Lou DeVoe Sleeper, I introduce you to a rarity, an honest to goodness native. <laughs> I think Lars that's Ron. the only reason I'm here, is because I'm native. Uh, <laughs> I am the native. Well, we'll find that out. <laughs> You're a lifetime resident of the village, and she's as passionate in her love for large Mon as Phyllis McGinley was. She just hasn't had time to take pen in hand. A graduate of Mamaroneck School, she found a summer job at age 17 at Time Magazine to replace an office boy who left for service in WW2. An English major at Smith College, she took her shiny diploma back to time and found a job first in the International Public Relations Department and later the Personnel Department. After her marriage to Gordon Sleeper, she eventually left for what turned out to be a permanent maternity leave, <laughs> during which time her three sons, Gordon Jr., David, and Carrie arrived were taught proper table manners and how to win academic and sports prizes. A very involved member of the PTAs of Grammar through High School, she served on the Student Aid Fund and the School Board Selection Committee and the Village of Larchmont Committee. She was a very active member of the Junior League of Westchester on the Sound, the League of Women Voters, and is involved in Larchmont Avenue Church Committees. In 1960, she joined a legendary a member of the Burbank real estate firm, her mother, Vivian DeVoe, known and loved by hundreds of residents for whom she found houses. Emmy Lou quickly became one of the most respected and successful realtors in Westchester County and eventually president of a greatly expanded Burbank real estate company, which merged with Sutton Whittemore to become Burbank Whittemore on January 1, 1990. Her professional credits are impressive and lengthy. But it should be noted this past November in New Orleans, she received the most coveted award in her field from her peers in the National Association of Realtors, the Certified Real Estate Brokerage designation. She appears today, however, without any medals or service ribbons or anything. But I think uh, interesting to all of us who've laughed a lot about it, Emmy Lou and Gordon hold what I would imagine is the world's record for grandchildren with the most unusual names. <laughs> a heady stew of Gaelic and Southern family surnames. <laughs> Declan, Lydon, Buck, Aiden, C-A-C-L-A-N, which is Keelan, but nobody would know that unless they were Irish. Nye, DeVoe, and C-I-A-R-A-N, which is Kieran in Gaelic. Emily, why don't you pick up on the village as it was when you were growing up, as it was when you were raising your children, and the village today. Well, what I'm fascinated with is that uh, we're all here for the same reasons, and we're talking about a lot of the same things. People come here, came here then because of the beauty of the place, because of the water, because of the recreation, because of the fishing, back with the Indians, because of the proximity to other things, and eventually because of the wonderful school system. And that's the primary reason they come now. Uh, I was in the first kindergarten class that went into the new school at Chatsworth. The new school at Chatsworth was dedicated in 1930, and it's that brick building that was there. <laughs> and the principal of the school was a marvelous woman named Miss Stewart, who looked a little bit like Queen Victoria and always wore evening dresses to school. 
<laughs> I think that's lovely. <laughs> what that did for my education, I'm not sure. <laughs> we, uh, How after, often she, did she change her dress? <laughs> almost every day. And lots of evening. And she sort of wafted like a ship under full sail <laughs> through the halls of Chatsworth <laughs> Avenue School. It was wonderful. We, I hadn't always thought I would come back to Larchmont to live. But after World War II, and when I came back and started having a family, and my mother was in the real estate business, I couldn't find a house anyplace else that I could afford. And that's how I came back, and I'm awfully glad I did. My children went to the same schools I did, except that the junior high was in a different position. They, even in senior high, had some of the same teachers I did, much to the chagrin of the teachers in the senior high. <laughs> I went and your children. <laughs> yeah, they didn't like that either. Uh, I went to Murray recently to talk about Larchmont for the centennial. And they said, well, what's different? What was it like when you were growing up, and what's it like now? I reminded them that there was a goat farm where the Washington Square apartments used to stand, and that the goats regularly got loose on Chatsworth Avenue and ran across the railroad bridge into Larchmont. And I can remember that well. That was as late as the 1930s. It certainly was. And during World War II, we had many, many um, air raid drills where I was always the injured victim in the middle of a street, <laughs> labeled broken leg, <laughs> head battered. Slightly so, confused. Slightly <laughs> confused, always confused. And that's another thing I want to talk about with Larchmont, is that the quality of volunteerism, as evidenced in all those air raid, air raid drills, has been marvelous mm -hmm. ever since the time I was growing up. Uh, I think there are more people involved in local committees here and at local levels than in any other community in Westchester County. And we like to think that all those moguls that we have who live here or who have lived here, all those wonderful poets and playwrights and television people that have lived here and given their time have given us a quality of life that can't be gotten anyplace mm -hmm. else. It's been wonderful. Would you, t would you tell everybody the story about your, your mother uh, and the postman? It illustrates to me how what a small, wonderful village uh, you lived in? Well, I lived in a place that, uh, I lived on Forest Park Avenue when I was growing up, and everybody knew everything that was going on, including and especially the postman. So that when I went away to summer camp one year, the postman named Robert came running up to my grandmother who lived with us and said, oh, baby's sick, baby's sick, <laughs> baby's got the chicken pox, because that's what I'd written on the postcard. And of course, you always read everybody's postcard. <laughs> so that was kind of fun. But I do remember wonderful instances of, with my children, when one of my boys decided when he was very little that he didn't want to sleep over anymore at a friend's house and walked down Beach Avenue by himself at midnight, mm -hmm. and a policeman followed him discreetly so as not to scare him, to see that he got all the way home, mm -hmm. and then came in and asked me if he was all right. And mm -hmm. I think that quality mm -hmm. of life mm -hmm. is still here. I think it's a walk around, bike around town, and it's a village, and it's a little gem. You also uh, had- water's water's it. There were so many stories about Emily Lou's mother, Vivian DeVoe, who was a, who was a really well-established opera singer before she married her husband and settled down in Larchmont. But she was of most persuasive real estate lady. She mothered everybody she sold a house to. And she took one couple to a house. You tell the story. Well, she was, uh, she was a marvelous salesperson because if somebody passed a house, and this is a true story. Somebody said, I like that house. She said, hold on, let's go see if it's for sale. <laughs> Went up, knocked on the door, and a maid answered the door. And she said, hello, I'd like to show this house for sale. And the maid, not knowing any differently, said, OK, come on in. People wanted to buy the house, and she convinced the owner to sell it shortly <laughs> thereafter. So she was <laughs> quite a tradition to follow. Well, it was a very small uh, office that you entered when you went back to work in 1960. How many people are, are how many realtors are there in all of Larchmont now? Oh, well over 100. Uh, over 100? Oh, certainly. Yeah. Well, over, yeah. closer to 150. Probably. You're, talk, you're talking realtors, not real estate agents. Well, realtors, a realtor so is a real estate broker, so yeah. realtors and realtor associates. 
So there'd be that. even more if we were talking agents, mm -hmm. salespeople mm -hmm. too. Mm. No total. That's the total. Oh, that's the total. Yeah, well, that's a lot. How that is a lot. Uh, yes. Not that many houses mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. Uh, how, yeah, speaking of houses, there isn't much land to be built on anymore, so houses just have to be keeping resold or recycled. And there hasn't been a lot of land the whole time I've lived here. On the fringes, there has been land that mm. has developed. Mm. But the unique thing about Larchmont is the diversity of the housing, from the Tudors to the Victorians to the Colonials to the ranches and the Capes. And that's this diversity, I think, is what makes Larchmont something special, too. There isn't any, as far as I can see, there isn't any keeping up with the Joneses here. You do your thing, you contribute to the village, you love living here because it's a walk around, bike around town. And that's what makes it enjoyable. And it certainly is a beautiful place to be. Well, the demographics, I know when we uh, moved to Larchmont, the demographics appealed to us because the um, adult education uh, committee had just done a survey of the, of the um, area and it broke down in thirds of Catholics, Protestants, and Jews. And Who did the survey? It was the Adult Education Committee and it seemed to us that that was a very good balance and mix and it was very good for our children to be able to grow up with that uh, kind of diversity. Well, I think that ecumenism has certainly held over. One of the marvelous things that happened not too long ago was that the Larchmont Temple and the Larchmont Avenue Church took a trip to Israel together with the rabbi mm -hmm. and the minister. Mm -hmm. And that was a memorable event. Surely, surely. But it, um, the, one of the criticisms of the village is that as, I, I hate to criticize the, any real estate people, don't. <laughs> but it's been very difficult for um, our service people and our teachers to be able to live here once the prices shot up. I know, that's lamentable. And however, do you see a change? However, <laughs> however, since 1987, the prices have gone down precipitously, especially in the lower priced houses. And we are seeing now, since January 1991, people that are moving in town that never could afford to be here before. And I think that's wonderful. The entry level house is here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that means around $200,000 or a little bit below. What we don't have in Larchmont, and what I wish we had, was affordable apartments. We have a lot of affordable co-ops and condos, but we need affordable rented, renting, rented apartments. But there's no land for them. I know. Well, no. there's some that could be utilized. Could we build up on Susan Morella's house, just build straight up, <laughs> like over the museum, <laughs> modern art museum? No, because we'd Sorry. have all the historical <laughs> society after this. St. Bartholomew. Yeah, right. <laughs> I have it. I'm sorry, yeah, I, just, I had a question. I wanted to go back a little bit and ask you. One of your ancestors is Frederick DeVoe. Right. It? And Frederick DeVoe was a well-known citizen in the Rochelle area. Uh, and he unfortunately backed the wrong side during the revolution. <laughs> and as a result, the committee of, I've forgotten what it was called, sequestration or something, took away his land and gave it to another American citizen named Thomas Paine. Wasn't that too bad? <laughs> yes, because <laughs> if it's feared back the other side, you would probably be owning half I of know. North Russia. I've, I've seen a map that says that the family owned from the Thomas Paine Museum yeah. all the way to Weaver Street. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that brings to mind, uh, can the Algonquins ever reclaim their land, Philip? The problem is that the Algonquins were never an entity. They were a language group. The Siwanoi have long since disappeared. The deal that they made with uh, for Mamaroneck was, if it, w it was legal by British law, the uh, Indians had no concept of property or transfer of property. They thought when they sold it that they were buying a neighbor or acquiring a neighbor, and they were acquiring a landlord. And they never understood that. It was just two separate cultures. The English were wedded to the concept of property. The Indian to the, pros the concept of sharing. And uh, they just never, never could, could get together. It was just a difference in uh, culture, which explains the disappearance of many people. Yes, yeah. But uh, that was, that was the problem with it. But if some of our viewers have something that they think might uh, be of historical significance, should they bring it up to the office and and have you and Bruce look at it? Oh, absolutely. They should. What give, are you looking um, for? They should give. Um, Give us a call. Um, what am I looking for? I'm looking for my. No, no. What are the, what is the office number. looking for? 
Oh, right. um, virtual, virtually anything, anything that you have. Just recently, a um, young woman was cleaning out an attic in the village, or perhaps it was a cellar in the village of Mamaroneck for an elderly relative, and she called up and left a message on the um, answering machine. The archives is open um, only on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays from 1 to 3, but we have a telephone number which is listed in the directory, and there's an answering machine there, and somebody will very quickly return a call. Anyway, this young woman in Mamaroneck was cleaning out some elderly relative's attic or basement, called up and left a message on the machine, said, I've got some old stuff here. I don't think you want it, but, you know, maybe. And it was a treasure trove. One of the things that was in it was a 1900 curriculum for the um, um, uh, Mamaroneck School Board. But, you know, not just the curriculum, photographs. And, I mean, it was, uh, there were many other lovely things there. So a lot of people, they look at things and they yeah. say, Oh, what's this? Especially if they're cleaning out for somebody else. So we would say, please, don't throw anything away until you've called us. Give us a chance. Yes. May I say, that's a, I, I think the real tragedy is that a great deal of the history of Larchmont, being a transient community, community for a good part of its years, has been left on the sidewalk for the trash. Yes, exactly. And how much history has been thrown away by pe people who either don't know that it is of any interest they think it has no value, therefore it has no interest. Uh, and they don't know what else to do with it. And uh, it, as Judy mm -hmm. says, if people would just say, look, look, maybe somebody would be interested in this. Well, it's also spring cleaning time. So if you're spring cleaning, happens, yeah. uh, don't forget the Historical mm -hmm. Society when yeah. you come on any of your treasures. This has been a wonderful start to our first in the series of I Know a Village. And I thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Judith Spikes, Philip Reisman, Jr., and Emmy Lou DeVoe Sleeper for taking part in this and making it a fine send-off. Thank you very year. much. That was fun. So, good.